United Kingdom. Ever since he did that, I've always thought, my, I would like to do that too. Comprising more than a hundred objects and over 23,000 gemstones, the crown jewels are priceless, being of incalculable cultural, historical, and symbolic value. They are a part of the royal collection that is held in trust for the monarch of a nation. St. Edward's Crown of 1661 is the most important of all of the crowns in the collection. It is only used at the moment of the crowning itself. This magnificent solid gold frame weighs nearly five pounds. It is adorned with semi-precious stones. St. Edward's crown was last used for crowning Queen Elizabeth II in 1953. The second most important crown is the Imperial State Crown of 1937. That is the crown that the monarch wears as they leave Westminster Abbey after their coronation. It is used on other state occasions, including the annual state opening of Parliament. That crown is made of gold and set with 2,868 diamonds, 17 sapphires, 11 emeralds, 269 pearls, and four rubies. This crown contains some of the most famous jewels in the entire collection. These include the Black Prince's Ruby, the Stuart Sapphire, the Caldean's Two Diamond. In St. Edward's Sapphire, which is set in the center of the topmost cross, is said to have been worn in a ring by St. Edward the Confessor and discovered in his tomb in 1163. That's just two of the crowns. Yes, I think I would enjoy going to London and looking at the crowns. However, looking at the crowns of the New Testament is of much more benefit to us spiritually as Christians today. I want to invite you to turn to John chapter 19 beginning in verse 1. And first of all, today I want us to take a look at the crown of thorns. In John 19, verses 1 through 5, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers planted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold, the man. What a terrible sight it must have been to see Jesus wearing a crown of thorns. First of all, think about the material of the crown. I read of a preacher who discussed his visit to what is believed to have been the place called Calvary. 
He said, quote, I wasn't prepared for what I saw. I had assumed that it would be very beautiful. It wasn't. It was hideous, rocky, even dirty. There was litter everywhere. There were some old trees and bushes growing on top. Muslim graves were everywhere. I thought that at least some flowers would be blooming on the top of Mount Calvary. There were no flowers. There were long, hideous thorns bushed everywhere. They were big, long, spiny thorns. And it was probably thorns like those which composed the crown which was placed on the head of our Lord. You know, thorns were the direct result of man's first sin. Go back to Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. The very first reference to thorns in the Bible will be found in the Lord's conversation with Adam and Eve after their fall in the garden. In Genesis 3, 17, unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, say, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shall thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Thorns are here in the physical world because of man's failure to abide by the word of the Lord. Thorns represent the consequence of man's disobedience to God. So here is the sinless, spotless Savior of the world with the thorns that came into being due to man's disobedience. And here he is, standing, hurting, because man sinned in the long ago. But second, think about the making of the crown. You will notice there in John that it says the soldiers deliberately platted it. It was a collective work. It was not just the action of one person. And in reality, all of us had a part in weaving that crown. Because Isaiah says in Isaiah 53 and verse 5, he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. So in a very real sense, our sins crucified Jesus, and our fingers wove the crown. Our hands slapped his face. And our sins were the nails that held him on the cross, and our hard hearts were the hammers that drove the nails. But not only that, third, think about the misery of the crown. The crown of thorns was an instrument of torture. Only sin could have done a thing like that. I'm told that the temple area of one's head is one of the most sensitive areas in all of the body. Every thorn would have created a stream of blood. And as they would say in Isaiah 52 and verse 14, his visage was so marred more than any man. His head and his face would be a bloody pulp. But not only that, in the fourth place, think about the mockery of the crown. Turning over to Matthew chapter 27 and verse 29, it says, And when they had planted a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They mocked him. They ridiculed Jesus, and they went through this awful mockery of a false coronation. 
of our Lord. Our Lord had to endure the shame and humiliation of that. I think about Hebrews 12, 2 and 3, which says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and was set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And yes, I know that's talking about the cross, but you know, when you think about it, before the Lord ever got to the cross, there was shame to be despised. There was mockery. There was humiliation involved. Then also I think about the message of the crown. His crown of thorns was a crown of victory. And I know it looked hideous and, and ugly, but as we view it now, in retrospect, with a mind's eye, it's much more beautiful to us because our precious Lord was willing to be crowned with a crown of thorns for you and me. Yes, I think about that imperial state crown of the Queen of England. Set with 2,868 diamonds and 17 sapphires and 11 emeralds, 269 pearls and 4 rubies and all of those priceless gems. But her crown fades into insignificance when I see the crown that my precious Lord was willing to wear for me that faithful day. The crown of thorns. Second, I would have you turn to Revelation 19. And I would have you look at the crowns of the triumphant Christ. The crowns of the triumphant Christ. Revelation 19, 11, I saw heaven opened and behold, a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he did judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. You know, I was thinking about how one of the most prestigious titles in sport and among the most difficult to win is called the Triple Crown. Since the early 1900s, only 12 horses have won the Triple Crown, which is the Kentucky Derby, the Preakness Stakes, and the Belmont Stakes in the same year to claim that honor. 12 horses. Sir Barton, 1919. Gallant Fox, 1930. Omaha, 1935. War Admiral, 37. Whirl Away, 41. Count Fleet, 43. Assault, 46. Citation, 48. And not another one until Secretariat in 1973. Seattle Slough, in 1977, affirmed in 1978, and finally American Pharaoh in 2014, uh, 2015. That's it. Horse racing is called the sport of kings. Winning the triple crown stands as the crowning achievement. We're here in Revelation chapter 19, one of the most dramatic moments in the book of Revelation. John sees heaven open that he might see the conquering Christ. What did he see? He saw a white horse. The white horse is the symbol of the conqueror. The Lord would return as a conquering warrior on a magnificent steed. But notice what he said next. 
and on his head were many crowns. And when you look up that word crown, that is the word diadem. And that suggests royalty and rulership. And when you think about being crowned with more than one crown, that may sound strange, but in the time of John, it was absolutely quite natural because it was not uncommon for a king to wear more than one crown in order to show that he was king of more than one country. For example, when Ptolemy entered Antioch, he wore two crowns or diadems, one to show that he was Lord of Asia and one to show that he was Lord of Egypt. I thought about boxers holding different championships. I looked it up and I found that the most championship belts held at one time, both major and minor in one division, would be Roy Jones Jr. with nine at light heavyweight. Nine at one time. He held the WBA Super, WBA, WBC, IBF, IBO, IBA, WBF, NBA, and Ring Magazine belts at the same time. That's a lot of letters. Can you imagine coming to the ring carrying nine championship belts? I guess you could try to wear three across your abdomen and, and maybe three on, on each arm. Well, on the head of Christ, there are many crowns to help show that he is Lord of all and King of all. Drop down to Revelation 19, 16. He hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Here's the conquering Christ. He has a name on his garment, probably on the skirt of his robe, lying over his thigh as he rides the white horse. He is king of kings and lord of lords. What more appropriate name could be given to him? He's king over all. He's lord over all. All are subject to his power. In Acts chapter 2, Peter said that God had exalted him upon his ascension. And then verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified both Lord and Christ. His power and his authority is supreme. Kings of the earth, no matter how powerful, are beneath him. Lords, however great, have to ultimately answer to him. Here are the crowns of the triumphant Christ as we see him. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. The crown of thorns, the crowns of the triumphant Christ, but in the third place this morning, I want us to see and look at the crowns of the triumphant Christian. Jesus wore the crown of thorns that he might become the triumphant Christ, that we might become triumphant Christians. And as we have seen, Jesus wears many diadems, that type of crown, represents regal supremacy. That's reserved for Christ alone. However, there is another type of crown in the Bible called Stephanos in the Greek. That's the wreath or the victor's crown. And rather than representing regal supremacy, that one represents worthy service. And the Christian may wear different Stephanos crowns for their loyal service. And did you know that there are five 
Five of these special crowns listed in the scripture. Let's take a look at it. Turn to 1 Corinthians 9, 24, 25. First of all, there is the incorruptible crown. The incorruptible crown. In 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that you may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Well, this is Corinth. The Isthmian Games were held at Corinth. Top athletes from all over the Roman Empire came to Corinth. They would compete in events like running and leaping and discus throwing and boxing and wrestling. And as the victor stood before the judges, Bema, an official of the Ishmael Games would place upon their heads a pine or wild celery wreath. The word for crown here is Stephanos, the victor's crown. We get our name Stephen from this word. If you've ever seen the movie Ben-Hur, with Charlton Heston. Then you've seen this kind of crown. All that pain, all that sweat, all that sacrifice for a withering wreath. For the one who victoriously runs the race of life and is tempered in all things, like a long distance runner ran the race of life and in training, that incorruptible crown will be presented. But Paul says it takes temperance. Take self-control, the ability to say no to temptation, no to self-indulgence, no to distraction. What are you reading? What are you watching? What are you fantasizing about? These can be difficult questions to face, but they're necessary because these moments are the times when Satan targets us. Paul says you got to learn temperance to obtain the incorruptible crown. Here's another one. Look at 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 and 20. 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 and 20. Second, there is the crown of rejoicing. The crown of rejoicing to precious newborn Christians at Thessalonica. Paul says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For ye are our glory and joy. So here's a crown for those who have led people to Christ, who have built them up as new Christians. Imagine standing in heaven surrounded by all the people that you have influenced for the sake of the gospel. Your dear sister, your uncle, your son, your co-worker, your neighbor, maybe the teenager you set beside on the bus, or the many people who have been converted through missionaries that you have supported, or preachers that you have supported, or through the work of a Bible answer. I tell you, it was a source of joy to me last week to have people come to our meeting from great distances whom I have never Meant. Who would come in the door and say, We watch a Bible answer. And we wanted to come and support this meeting. What a thrill. To receive the crown of rejoicing. We need to strengthen our ability to spread the gospel in ways that are available to us so that we too can experience the joys of spiritual childbirth, both now and and throughout eternity. Crown of rejoicing. But not only that, in the third place, there's the crown of righteousness. Turn to 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. The crown of righteousness is reserved for those who, like Paul, have lived for Christ's return. And you say, who can say just like he did, 
in 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. And you know when he penned that, he was living in the dark shadows of the Mamertine prison. And as he reflected on his years with Christ, seeing him on the Damascus road, and his conversion in the house of Ananias, and all of his missionary travels, and his painful sufferings, he didn't have any regrets. He fought the good fight, finished the course, kept the faith. And a crown of righteousness would be God's reward for a righteous life. It's not that the crown is righteous. It's that it's bestowed for righteousness. And you know, Paul is still doing good through his writings by means of his dedicated example. All of those chapters that he wrote, all of those books that he wrote, he'll continue to do good right up until the time of the judgment as men live and learn from his life and his labors and his apostolic instruction and his 14 inspired books and 100 chapters. Because Paul loved his appearing and looked for it, he lived righteously. The only way we can receive the crown of righteousness is to live a righteous life now. That's the only way. Now turn to 1 Peter 5, 3 and 4. In the fourth place, among the crowns of the triumphant Christian, there's the crown of glory. This is given to elders who shepherd God's flock willingly, sacrificially, humbly, and with integrity. 1 Peter 5, 3 and 4. Neither has been lords over God's heritage, but made in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, he shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Here's a crown of glory for serving humbly and sacrificially in positions of leadership. This victory crown, this wreath, was worn by the champions of athletic contests and victors in war, and it was a symbol of honor and glory and prestige, and they would make it of these leaves or flowers. Well, they didn't have to be replaced. It was a fading one. He says of the Christian's crown, it's one that fadeth not away. Heaven will never lose its original beauty, luster, or brightness. These crowns are as real today for the Christian as when the inspired man first told about them. One more. Look at Revelation 2 and verse 10. There is the crown of life for the man or woman who perseveres unto trial. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of of life. Notice that the word in the King James Version is not until, it is unto. Most people, even while reading the King James Version, will say until, and they'll quote it that way, when that's not what it says. It actually says unto. Now I'm aware that we've got some modern versions that are using until instead of unto. But the American Standard Version of 1901 and one of the newest standard translations, the English Standard Version, uses the word unto. Vincent's word studies agrees with that. And it says of this Greek phrase, quote, not faithful until the time of death, but faithful up to a measure which will endure death for Christ's sake. It is an intensive, not an extensive term. So it shows us 
the extent to which they were to be faithful. It also demonstrates the value of Christianity, too. Continued faithfulness meant the rich reward of life's crown. They could die for the master, but they would receive a crown of life. Those faithful even unto death have the promise of life eternal and the crown of life. Focusing on eternity is difficult. Constantly bearing down on us is our pressing load of worries, the house repairs, the job demands, the unpaid bills, and add to that the bumps and the bruises of personal relationships. And our hearts often remain earth bound. We're just caught up in that. But this study of the crowns of the Christian ought to bring eternity more into view. And remember, friends, the crown of thorns which made these crowns of triumph possible. How can we thank Jesus enough? There's a famous painting by Goats entitled Despised and Rejected of Men. It pictures a thorn-crowned Jesus in the middle of a busy highway. Quote, He is surrounded by people of every description and station in life. The workman with his pick, the horseman with his riding whip, the mother with her child, the newsboy shouting the latest sensation. But taking another look at that painting, and you will see that all eyes are turned away from the Christ. No one is paying any attention to him. This is a true representation of the way of the world. Jesus can be rejected now, but he won't be rejected forever. He's coming in glory as King of kings, Lord of lords. Those that refuse to accept him now will be rejected then, but those that accept him now will be accepted by him then. Nothing could be more serious. Believe in Christ, turn from sin, be born again of water and of the Spirit into the kingdom of God, John 3, verse 5. Child of God, are you practicing self-control to win the incorruptible crown? Are you seeking to save the lost to win the crown of rejoicing? Are you living a righteous life to win the crown of righteousness? Are you serving humbly to win the crown of glory, will you be faithful even unto death that you might win the crown of life? The lesson is yours. We urge you to come as together we stand and sing.